Well, all right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so good to be back and uh, be able to gather together with you tonight. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for everyone who's been praying for me and, and uh, my family during this time of uh, the surgery, the sinus surgery that I had. And so I'm thankful for that. And I can say that I'm getting better every day. Um, the All the coughing, the terrible coughing that I had has been tremendously better. And I think it will continue uh, to the point that hopefully I won't have any of that. Um, it has has been getting much better. And it's, um, um, it's a process. There's some healing to be done. And before that, Hopefully, uh, you know, it won't be too bad, but at the end of that, I, I just look forward to it being a, a good thing. So thank you for all of that, and um, thank you for praying for my wife, and many of you have already got the prayer chain and you knew about it, and maybe some of you that are tuning in didn't know. She fell about two weeks ago now, well, a week and a half ago, and um, she actually ended up breaking a bone in her face and hurting her shoulder and so we're still dealing with doctor's appointments for that but praise god we did find out no surgery on the face and um we'll hopefully know something soon about the shoulder so um thank you for your prayers continue to lift us up in that and um as i get started tonight i do want to just share one other thing and ask for uh prayers for our family uh, i know for some people it, it's kind of strange to ask for you to pray about an animal but our um our smallest member of our family, our dog, Doodle, is, um, I had to take him to the, the vet, and he's having to stay in the, the vet hospital uh, right now uh, because he is um, has pancreatitis and severely dehydrated. So didn't know dogs did all of that, but found out they do. And so um, just pray for him because it's, um, it's a tough situation. And um, for all of us, he is a member of our family. So keep us lifted up and all of that. And um, we, uh, we certainly thank you for that. Now, uh, one other announcement I want to make as I get started. This is uh, the 18th of November. I will tell you that uh, as traditionally we do the week of Thanksgiving, which is next week. The church will not have any services next week during the week. So next Wednesday night, we will be off again, um, as well as the uh, the students will be off. All, everybody will be off. And we just encourage you to spend that time with your family and enjoy the, the, the time of Thanksgiving. Um, so we'll make sure that I remind you of all of that. Now, picking up tonight, we are finally back in Revelation again. Um, Went through the seven letters to the seven churches, which I initially thought was going to take about seven weeks. It looks like it's going to take about 14 um, because it just uh, every other week something was coming up and we will be on that same schedule again next week. So we are actually tonight going to be on the sixth letter to the sixth church. And so uh, one of the things that I want us to remember and think about the letters is uh, when we first started, we talked about the letters. And remember, we talked about the first and the last letter kind of mirror each other. The second and the next to last letter kind of mirror each other. And then the three in the middle kind of go together with the, the center letter being the uh, being the uh, fifth or uh, fourth letter. The fourth letter being the letter um, that says um, you're dead. Uh, so you know, the church is dead. So um Tonight we're on the second to last letter, and it has in common with it what the second letter has, and that is that both of those letters, um, the letter to the church at Smyrna and the letter to the church at Philadelphia, both of those letters uh, do not rebuke the church, but instead commend the church for the job that they are doing. So that's a good thing, uh, something that if I were to receive a letter from the Lord, directly telling me about how things are, I would I would like to have one that uh, commended and didn't rebuke. Uh, however, we know that that's not um, an easy thing to happen, but in this situation it did. Um, both letters uh, called for the church to be faithful, um, and both letters uh, that we have uh, that go together and all of that, uh, they address something that um, is the synagogue of Satan, uh, which we found out in the first letter, 
that the synagogue of Satan are those who say they're Jews but are not. Um, and so those are the ones that they're addressing as the synagogue of Satan. So a lot of similarities in the second to last letter and the second letter. Those two, as I said, go together. So we're going to pick up in chapter 3, verse 7. That's the beginning of that letter. And we're going to read down, uh, we'll read that whole letter, and then we'll go back and break it down and talk about all of that. So in verse 7 of chapter 3 of Revelation, it says, Unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, again, second to last letter, and as we read that, the, some of the amazing things that we see is that there is not a, a reprimand, there is not a, um, uh, those are not being um, chastised, they're actually being commended for the things that they did. They're not being rebuked, but they're being commended. And so as we read that letter, that's a good thing, and then it goes on to talk about several things there that I want us to look at and to break down. The first thing that I want us to look at is the way that Jesus announces his, himself and some of the things that he talks about. In chapter 3 and verse 7, one of the things that it says is, um, it says, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, and he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So I want to talk about that a little bit because, you know, these again are all uh, adjectives that were used to describe Jesus in the first chapter um, that he himself, uh, that John described having seen in Jesus. And now they're being used in the letter to the churches to give those descriptors of Jesus. And he announces himself as the Holy One, the True One. Now, the thing is, when we think about that, the Holy One and the True One, he announces himself as that. That's something that we really need to hold on tightly to because there are people who say, uh, you know, I have the truth. Or there are people who lead us to, to believe that they have the truth or that they are good leaders or that they know the right ways and, and those kind of things. But Jesus says, listen, I am the Holy One. Right out of the gate, I am the Holy One. There's no other. Understand that. Jesus is saying, I'm the one. I'm the one who is holy. I'm the one that you've been looking for. There is no other. It's me. I'm the one who is holy. He says, I am the one who is true. All these others that may have addressed themselves to the, the church, may have addressed themselves to the world as true, they're not true. They're false. They're false prophets, and I am the true one. There is nothing false about me. So he's letting them know right out of the gate. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to consider, is this true? I'm telling you, I'm the holy one. I am the true one. And then he goes on to say, um, not only is he holy and he is true, but he also goes on to say um, that he who has the key of David, the key of David who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So he, he tells us he's holy. He tells us he's true. And then he goes on and talks about the fact that he is, uh, has the key of David. And so um, this statement is kind of reminiscent um, to Isaiah chapter 22, 22, 
um, and they mention a key uh, that that as the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Um, uh, Matthew talks about a key to the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 16. And the, the whole reality about all of this is, is that Jesus is the one who is true. He's the one who is holy. He's the only one that has the key. So whatever he opens, nobody can shut it but him. Whatever he closes, nobody can open it but him. He is the true one. So all of these other people who claim that they can do this and that, and you may try to trust in some of those things, you can't trust in any of those because they're not true, they're not holy, and certainly they don't have the key. The key that lets um, whatever Jesus decides to open be open, and no one can shut it. See, we think about that. He has the key. We talk about the key to kingdom. We talked about uh, he has the key to the tomb, right? He has the key over death. So death no longer has a hold on us because Jesus has the keys to that. So there's no, that doesn't hold us anymore. But understand this too. He has the key to everything. If he opens a door, no one can shut it. If he opens something, then it remains open. No one can shut that. He's the only one that can do it. If he closes the door, then it's closed off by Jesus and nobody can reopen it. And so in all of the things that happen to us in life as he opens um, the doors for us, we don't have to worry about somebody else coming along and going, no, you can't, you can't take part in that because Jesus opened that. And we know it's going to remain. Um, or somebody saying, you have to go here. No, Jesus closed that door. That That's not going to happen. It's been closed. You can't go there. So right out of the gate, he's letting the churches know. And remember, it's a circular letter. It's designed to go to all of the churches, even though it's addressed to that specific church in Philadelphia. It's designed to go to all the churches. It's a circular letter to go to all the churches and be read in every one of them. In that letter, he's letting the churches know that who he is. He's true, he's holy, and he has the keys. So he's in charge. He's in control. Um, that's a great thing to think about, that Jesus can say that. He's in control. Nobody can change that. Nobody can change that. Um, we just finished election. Well, we really, it's not finished, but elections just happened uh, in our country. And Typically, when an election happens, you have a person who is in office and they run and, and at the end of it, either that person remains in office or a new person takes office. Either way, there is a, a, a power change, something that changes. There's, there's a, a transfer in that. And when that power is changed, when that transfer changes, now is the new person going to be able to do what the old person did or will they be able to do better than the old person did or whatever. We have to look at them and wonder, can they make things better? But when Jesus is in charge, and he is, when Jesus is in charge, we don't have to wonder uh, about those things. He is the one who opens the doors. He's the one who closes the doors, and nobody else can do anything about it. One president may set a certain policy, and another president may come in and change it. That can't happen with Jesus. If he opens that door, it's open. No one can change it. You know, well, Satan, you know, he's what, yeah, but Satan has no power against Jesus. He will close the door and Satan can't open it. He will open the door and Satan can't close it. So he's letting the churches know up front and us by reading the letter tonight, he's letting them know that he is, um, as some might say, large and in charge, right? He's holy, he's true, and he's got the keys. So now that we have all that established and we understand that that's what's going on, then um, what is he talking about exactly with open doors and, and all of that sort of stuff? Well, in chapter 3 and verse 8, Jesus says this. He says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and I have not and have not denied my name. So he's saying that there is a door that has been opened. Why is that door open? They couldn't open it in their own strength, but Jesus opened it in his strength. In their little strength, the little bit of strength that they had, what they have done is they have kept his word. And by keeping his word, Jesus has allowed the door to be opened because they have kept his word. How can they keep his word if they don't know his word? They have to know his word in order to keep it. it we understand that, that all of this that is going on the open door is because of the faithfulness of those in the church of Philadelphia. Remember, they weren't rebuked. They were instead uh, commended because of keeping his word. They were doing the right thing. Well, what are you talking about, Pastor, keeping his word? What does that mean? Well, 
What is his word? What is his word? His word is this, right? His word is, is scripture, keeping his word. When we study his word and we read his word, what are we called to do? We're called to share the gospel with people who don't know. We're called to live the gospel. We're called to follow everything in his word. We're called to do that. And so when it's talking about they in their little bit of strength kept his word. They shared the gospel. That's not an easy thing because during that time, um, the Romans didn't like it and the Jews didn't like it. The Romans didn't like it and the Jews didn't like it, but yet this church at Philadelphia kept his word. They kept his word. And what little bit of power, meaning in their own strength, they did everything they could to keep his word, which meant then that in his strength, the door would be opened. And so they did everything that they could. They kept his word. They remained faithful in the things that they did. They remained faithful. And so then Jesus applied the key of David and he opened the door. Okay. Um, Elsewhere in the New Testament, an open door refers to an opportunity to minister or evangelize. That's another play, thing that it talks about with an open door. That's exactly what Jesus does. In their little bit of strength to keep his word, he opens the door and allows it to stay open for those to evangelize and minister to other people. As a church today, we, we kind of forget that's our mission. That's what it's all about. Too many times as churches today, we, we think, we have in mind that our mission is to put as many people in the pews as we can and to, you know, have a good service and have people come and be happy and enjoy the time and, you know, all of those things. And, and that's fine. It's fine that we have those kind of things. And it's always good when people come and they leave, leave smiling and happy and, um, you know, those kind of things. But look, if that's all we're worried about, then we need to shut the doors because we're not doing God's word. We're not living it out. All we're doing is entertaining people, and that is not at all what we need to be doing. What we need to be doing is what God's word tells us. We need to keep his word by ministering to people, by witnessing to people, by sharing the gospel. Listen, if, if, if the church doors are open and people come in and the word is preached and the truth is hard and it hits in a place where they walk out broken and saddened because of the the things in their life and it destroys them to a point where they realize the only hope they have is to give their life to Christ, then that's way more important than anybody walking out and saying, what a wonderful service. I had a great time today. Well, okay, I hope you do. I hope that you have a great time worshiping the Lord. But more importantly, what I want to know is, did God speak to you in that service today? Did Were there things in your life that God just broke you over? Were there things in your life that you realized you needed to do and weren't? Were there things in your life that you needed attention and you needed to give it to God and you realize that today? Have your, Has your life been changed having been in God's presence? If that has happened, then amen. That's exactly what we need to do. But if you just walk in and the, and the music is good and the, the pews are soft and the air conditioner feels good and the preacher preached about heaven and that made you feel good and you walk out the door and you say, well, that was a great service. I'm, I enjoyed that today. Well, okay, again, there's nothing wrong with enjoying worship. We're supposed to enjoy that. But did it change you? Did it change you? Understand this, that when we come into the presence of God, and that's what coming into worship is, that's what this open door that he was talking about, that door is open so that people might come into the presence of God, that we may witness and minister to people to bring them into the presence of God. If we come into the presence of God and we walk out of the presence of God and nobody can tell that we've been in the presence of God, there's a problem. There's a problem. That means that we have become hardened and, and we're not being touched by the Spirit. You, you think about the fact when, um, when Jesus uh, was on the Mount of Transfiguration and those who came away from there were literally glowing, having been in the presence of God. They were different, having been in the presence of God. It was physical. They could see that, having been in the presence of God. Every Sunday morning when you walk into a church to worship corporately, you come into that open door that's been opened through the gospel story, that's been opened through the ministry of Christ, and you come into that door that's open when you walk in. Listen, you should walk in, and it should be a time of worship in the presence of our King, and when we walk out, we should be changed. We should be changed having been in the presence of God. 
if we're attending services and leaving services and there's no change that's happening, listen, church, we got to get on our knees and find out what's going on because we're not worshiping our true and living God. We're not truly giving him our heart if we walk in and walk out and nothing has changed. That door is open for evangelism, for ministry. It's open and no one can shut it. And we've got to continue to be faithful in keeping the word of God. And that means that every time we come into his presence, we ought to get broken somewhere because we're human beings and we've, we're flesh and we need to get broken somewhere so that we can be stronger in the next week. That's what it needs to be about. Listen, the open door. Jesus opens doors that no one can close, but he also closes doors that no one can open. Instead of going into those places where we no longer needed to go, if we're keeping God's word, then there are doors that should be closed to us. There are doors that should be closed and we should not ever have to go back in those places. And God can close those doors. He can do that. Jesus is telling us that he is the one that holds the key. He's the one that can do that. And if he can do that, then we got to trust him in that. He's telling these churches, listen, this is who I am. You can trust me. The open door <clears throat> refers to the opportunity for ministry and evangelism. And as we read this, and it seems that the church is doing just that, just that. And so um, this church in Philadelphia was small, seemed kind of insignificant, but it was one that was keeping the word of God. It was against all odds of Rome. And against all odds of the those that synagogue of Satan, those who said they were Jews, and all of that, they were still continuing to do that. And he goes on to say, not only that um, have they, um, he said, I know your works. I have set before you an open door. No one can shut for you have little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Have not denied my name. Well, that's 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 very important for us to realize. They have not denied his name. Listen, the Romans didn't want to hear about Jesus. And if people talked about him, they could be persecuted. The synagogue of Satan didn't want to hear about Jesus because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And so they were following the laws and they were not involved with, with God truly. They were saying they were Jews, but they weren't. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. So on all sides, it would be easy to just simply deny Jesus in the public eye. But if you did that, then you would not be keeping his word. He said, not only did you keep my word, but you have not denied my name. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. And so what does he say about that? Because all of these amounting odds and everything, they were still doing exactly what they said they needed to do. There was power in their relationship. There was power in their evangelism. There was power in their ministry. There was power in the fact that they did not, um, denounced the word of God. There was power in the fact that they trusted the true and holy Savior completely. And so in all of that, it's an amazing, amazing thing. But I want you to look at 3.9, and it says this. It says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Wow. Think about that. Listen, there are people of the world every day all around us that think we're just dumb because we worship God. They think we've lost it because we believe in a holy Savior. They, they treat us badly because they don't want to hear about it. They say all of those things. But listen, if we keep his word, if we keep his word, and if we don't deny him but we keep the faith, then listen, God's going to reward that. And in this, in, in verse 9, he says, and they will learn that I have loved you. They will learn that I have loved you. They will worship at your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. You, you're the one that was faithful. They're going to learn you were the one. You're the one that was faithful. And so um, it's incredible to think about that there is so many of God's chosen people, the Jews, the actual Jews that reject him. And so many of those who are um, Gentiles, those who are non-Jews, who have accepted him, that God's chosen people will see that God showed his love on 
the Gentiles and not the Jews when it comes to that time because they kept his word and they remained faithful and they did not deny him. So an incredible thing to think about for us, all of those who think that we're crazy for the things that we do. Listen, one day, if they don't ever accept Jesus, one day they're going to fall down on their feet and they're going to see that we're the ones that God loved. We're the ones that showed the love of Christ. Um, so then he goes on in, in verse 10. Now, verse 10 has received a lot of arguments, speculation. Um, it's been used to, to prove uh, two different thought processes uh, successfully. But it says this, it says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, the hour of trial. Many people will read that verse and will say that that points directly to the fact that says that Christians will not go through the tribulation. It says the hour of trial that will affect the whole earth. It's talking about the tribulation period. It's talking about the tribulation period. And so they'll say, because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, the tribulation period that will come upon the whole earth. So many will look at that and say, see right there, that's why I am a pre-trib person. I believe that God's going to resurrect his church before the tribulation because he says he will keep us from going through that period of trial. There are others that read that very same scripture and say what he means is that as we go through the period of tribulation, we will be protected. Because we've already persevered, because we've already done, then that means that he will keep us out of that tribulation. He will protect us during the tribulation, during that time that it's going on. So he will bring us through it. Again, that's a whole nother thing. And we start getting into arguing whether it's your four pre-tribulation or post-tribulation or uh, or in the middle of tribulation or whatever it is. That's a whole nother thing. The reality in this particular passage, I believe that we take it more directly and what it's saying to the church that was written to the church at Philadelphia, that because you have kept my command to persevere, his command to persevere, even though they were being persecuted by the Romans on one side and the Jews on the other side, they kept the command to persevere and they continued to walk through the open door and share the gospel and, and share the ministry and keep his word and be faithful. They continued to keep his command to persevere. And because of that, he's saying, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. I believe that he is saying to that church, that he's going to take care of them because you've persevered already. I'm going to take care of you. And rather than trying to jump into it and, and claim it for pre-trib or claim it for post-trib or whatever we want to claim it for, listen, let's just realize if we'll keep his commandments and we'll persevere and we'll do the things that he's called us to do, then there will be a reward on the other side of that. He will take care of us no matter how that happens, whether it's bring us to heaven before the tribulation or bring us through the tribulation, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What it matters is he's going to take care of us, however he chooses to do that. So instead of getting all wrapped up on that, let's just move past that verse 10, but understand that as we read this and as we look at it, that there are people that will point to that. But in this phrase, because you have kept my word about uh, patient endurance or uh, to persevere, uh, then in that phrase we see because of that, he's going to take care of us. So no matter what you think, if you think it means to be raptured before, or if you think that it means they'll be persevered through, we can, everybody can agree that um, he's going to keep his people safe because they have kept his word about patient endurance. Listen, I believe that applies to the church today. I believe that the church today, we have to persevere. We have to hold on as we go through the times in this, this life, this persecution from all different sides. As we do that, we have to keep going through that open door and keeping his word and keeping his commandments and, and keeping um, the, the ministry going and sharing God's word, evangelizing. We have to do that. Listen, we've got to continue to do that. We've got to work for that every single day. And I think if we 
persevere in that and we keep doing that, God's going to take care of us. God's going to take care of us. That doesn't mean we won't have any trouble because Scripture says you will have trouble in this world. The world hated him. Certainly it'll hate us. You will have trouble in this world, but he's going to take care of us no matter what. So when we read that and we look at that, keep that in mind that it doesn't really matter if you think it's before or after or whatever. He's going to take care of us. He says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now, there are some that really struggle with that because in, in, when this was written, I remember this wasn't written in the 21st century. Okay. This wasn't written in the 20th century. This was written many hundreds of years ago as we read this scripture and it says, I'm coming quickly. Well, a lot of people have a hard time with that because they say, well, he says he's coming quickly, but it's been all this time. So does that mean he was lying? He's really not coming quickly. Our time is not God's time. A thousand years to us may be like a second to God. We don't know how God's timetable works. Quickly, when you pair it up against eternity, a thousand years is pretty fast compared against eternity. So he's coming quickly. We don't know exactly what that means as far as when it will happen. It doesn't say I'm coming in 2021. It doesn't say I'm coming in 2030. It doesn't say I'm coming. In, it doesn't say any time. It says quickly, coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. In other words, I'm coming quickly, and what you need to do is hold on to the word. You need to continue to do what you're supposed to do. You need to keep the word of Jesus. Keeping the word of Jesus ensures that we don't lose our reward. We keep the word of Jesus. He's coming quickly. We've got to keep doing that. We don't know what quickly is. We don't know. Listen, for all these years, people have been saying, well, I don't know. It could be this year. Well, it could be this year. <laughs> we don't know. I have no idea. Maybe the, the, the way that the pandemic and all of 2020 is going to end is Jesus is coming back. Maybe that's the end. Maybe that's how it's going to get better. I don't know. Maybe all that's going to be the way it is, and, and, and it's going to be 100 years from now before Jesus comes back. Again, we don't know, but we know it's quickly in comparison to eternity. He says, I'm coming quickly, but be cautious. Be alert. Continue to stay in the Word. Continue to minister. Continue to worship. Continue to share the gospel. Continue to do that. Make sure that you do that. Then in verse 12, it says this, it says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. I will write on him my new name, a pillar in the temple. Now, some believe it could be, that could be an intended contrast. Could be an kin This is what I mean by that. The Jews in that time, uh, the synagogue of Satan they were talking about, the synagogue was the most important thing. And so the Jews had the synagogue. Nobody could go to the synagogue but the Jews. The Romans couldn't go there. If they were in the synagogue, the Romans couldn't make them participate in their, their cult. And they couldn't make them do those things. The synagogue was a thing. So they had the synagogue. Well, some look at it and they say, well, this is a contrast because the Jews had the synagogue, but those who trust in God, those who are Christians, those who have given their lives to him, they are the pillars of the synagogue. They're the very things that are holding it up in the first place. They're the pillars. Not only are they the pillars, they're the pillars of the temple of God. They're the pillars of the temple. They are the part that holds up the temple where everyone goes to worship. They are that pillar. They're that strong foundation in that. And so the synagogue, it's nothing without those pillars. <laughs> Got to have those pillars of the temple. And those pillars of the temple are those who keep his word, those who trust in Christ. And so um, it goes on to say not only are they pillars, but he also said that he's going to write on them the name. Jesus' true name, he said, I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven. Listen, those are going to be made into strong pillars. They will never leave. They're going to be part of that temple forever. 
and God's going to write his name on them, they are absolutely going to be part of that holy temple. And so think about how incredible that is. Those who overcome will enjoy absolutely everything there is about that. Everything. Jesus is holy. Jesus is true. Jesus has the keys. He's going to reward those who hold fast to him. And all of these things it, it is so much better than any kind of sin or idolatry or, or anything else could ever be. There are those today that say, well, you know, um, all you Christians, y'all are missing out on all this great stuff. There's so many wonderful things that, that you could be doing. Well, what are the wonderful things? Well, if you listen to what they're saying, those wonderful things are sin. Those sin are the things that lead to death. That death is the eternal separation from God. And in the end, no matter how pleasurable it might have been at the moment, in the end, it is no good. But when we hold fast to the word of God, in the end, it is so incredible that we can't even begin to describe it. It was so much better than anything that sin could ever, ever offer. So, Again, these letters, these circular letters written to the churches to be shared throughout. This is the second to last letter, mirrors the second letter, talks about the fact that um, the church is commended, not rebuked. It tells them to hold fast. The second letter says, hold fast until the point of death. Um, and this one says, hold fast as you're brought through this, um, um, you're going to be protected. Um, so all of these things go together. All of these letters as they go around are intended for those to be taught. How do I know that they're intended for people to be taught and to learn from those things? How do I know that's what it's talking about? Well, look at verse 13. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. The Christian church in these letters faced opposition from Rome. They faced opposition from the Jewish synagogue. They faced opposition from everywhere else. But what Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, their main opposition came from the synagogue, that synagogue of Satan. That was their main opposition, their main opposition. He's saying, listen, those who have an ear, let them hear. What you need to hear is the word of God. What you need to hear is the gospel story. What you need to hear is the thing that will allow you to have a relationship with Jesus. Well, the thing is to take you out of that relationship and that cult, take you out of the, the synagogue, take you out of the the, the Roman culture and put you in a place where you're giving your life to Christ. That's why it's so important for the church to continue to keep God's word, continue to share the gospel, continue to reach out to people, because listen, he's coming quickly. Now, how quickly? We don't know what that day is. If it, What if it's tomorrow and we didn't tell anybody about Jesus? It's too late. What if it's next week, but we still haven't told anybody? What if it's 10 years from now, but we've got to tell people. We've got to share the gospel story. We've got to continue to do that. Those who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear all of that. Hold on to it and then use it to keep God's word and to reach those who don't know him. So when we look at all of this, I want us to, to think about this as we close tonight. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. That's what John chapter 5 verse 24 says. And think about that's what we want the people to hear when the uh, passage ends with he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, we want to make sure that people know. We want to make sure that they uh, hear the word of God, that they listen to the word of God, and they accept the word of God. We want to be faithful and continue to keep the word of God and share the gospel story. This was written to the church at Philadelphia. It's applicable to us today just as much as it is them. And all of this that's happening, we need to know that Everyone needs to know the Lord. Everyone needs to know. Listen, that's the only hope any of us have. The only hope any of us have is to know the Lord. And so how will they know if we don't tell them? How will they know if we don't share the word? How will they know if we don't persevere and if we don't power through and if we don't keep the gate open and share the gospel story? How will they know? How will they know? Well, some of them make fun of us. Okay, that's all right. Share the word. You know what? God used it. His word will not return void. 
it will not return void. So we need to continue to do that. Continue to pray for our church family that we will be used by God in an amazing way. Continue to pray for those within our church family that um, are still struggling. Um, we have many in our church family that we still need prayers for. Uh, Miss Bawa had come home from the hospital. She's had to go back today. And so we want to continue to keep her lifted up in your prayers. Um, we want to continue to pray for the Dorset family. Um, we want to continue to lift up um, Vicky's mom and dad, lift up Brian and Lindsay and Reed, lift all them up. Continue to lift Vicky up as she's trying to help everyone and, and to deal with uh, all the things that are going on because it, it's a lot. <laughs> it's an awful lot. So continue to lift her up and lift up the family as well. But more than anything, more than anything, in this uncertain time that we're living in today, I want us to be certain that Jesus is holy, Jesus is true, that Jesus can open doors that no one can shut, he can shut doors that no one can open, and we are to remain faithful and to share his word and to share the gospel with all those that we come in contact with. Pray that God will use us like he's never used us before. Because listen, no matter what you hear on television, no matter what you hear on, on social media or the internet or anywhere else, the cure, the hope for America is not to unify the people. The hope for America is Jesus. And so what our hope should be is that we can reach as many people as possible. Because let me tell you, the more people that are reached, the more people that are unified in Christ, then that means the more people are unified in this world. We have to be diligent about reaching people for Christ because one day this world's going to end. It's temporal. It's temporal. That means it, it does not continue eternally, but it's only temporary. When this world ends, it's too late. So for those that don't know, they need to know now. We need to share the gospel. Are you mad about how things turned out? Listen, don't be mad. Instead, understand that you need to share the gospel. Are you upset because you feel like things should be different in our world? Well, they should be. You know how they can be? Share the gospel. Do you Are you at a place where you're wondering why are our churches not being filled up with people? Well, I can tell you why. Because we're not sharing the gospel like we need to do. We need to reach people for Christ. We need to keep his word and be faithful. We need to share the gospel in every possible way. Every way that we can. Listen, again tonight, I thank you for joining us. Remember, as I said, next week, Thanksgiving week, we have no services. There will be no Bible study on Facebook next Wednesday night. Uh, we plan on being back. I guess that would be the uh, the um, December. Um, I believe that's right. Let me look. That would be, um, yeah, no, nothing next Wednesday night. We'll be back on December the 2nd. December the 2nd, we'll be back con with our last letter in the seven letters to the churches. So we'll pick back up then in December. And um, no, uh, the student activities next Wednesday night, there won't be anything then either. We will meet Sunday morning, this Sunday morning at 1045. And I uh, we'll want to continue to join together in that. Um, the message this week, you know, I don't, I don't always share the, uh, I guess you'd say the, um, uh, I don't always let you know what's going to be preached about on Sunday morning. Uh, but I just want to tell you what is going to be the the title of the sermon this Sunday morning. The response for hard times. The response for hard times. And we're going all the way back to the Old Testament to talk about it. The response for hard times. Listen, it's hard times. It really is hard times. Uh, there's a lot going on. Things that we've never experienced. Things that we never want to experience again. But the response for hard times is what I want you to know. How we respond in that. And we're going to be talking about that on Sunday, 1045. All right. And um, so don't forget, join us for that um, Sunday morning. And if you can't be here in person, join us live on Facebook. Um, and just a reminder, in case you didn't know, if you have any problems watching it live on Facebook, um, you can watch it later. Or 
Um, usually around two, three o'clock in the afternoon, it's posted. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, and that's uh, Orchard Baptist Church, Mobile, Alabama. You go find that, and you can watch it on YouTube as well. So however you can access it, do that. Share it. Tell people about it. Like the page. Um, go to our website and check in. I'm new here. Let you see all kind of things, and and um, uh, be sure that you uh, save that. Put it out, share it with everybody. Because listen, how do you know that someone won't just accidentally turn in, tune in to a service on our Facebook or our YouTube channel and God reaches them through that? How incredible is that? that that's amazing. So share that. Listen, I know that probably everybody that's watching tonight, I see a lot of the names of the people that's watching. And I know that probably everybody that's watching tonight, obviously you have a Facebook account because you're watching on Facebook. All of you that are watching on Facebook, I can I can look at this list that I see right now, and I know that every one of you that are watching, you will forward a, a post from somebody, you'll repost something, you'll like a post from somebody, and you'll put it out there, and it's nothing more than, I don't know, making a, a cake out of, um you know, to look like a woven basket. Oh, that was really cool, so you share that. Well, that's great, that's wonderful. It doesn't affect anybody's eternity. Not once. Not once would that affect anybody's eternity. But when you share the link to our sermons, when you like our page, when you um, post that back out there for others to see, it just might change somebody's life. They may come to know the Lord because of it. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to do that and uh, share with your friends. Listen, I'm going to go ahead and close in a word of prayer. And um, we'll continue on from there. Let's, let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for this night. God, what an incredible time together with you. Father, it's been a, a really rough couple of weeks for me and my family. It seems like every day there's something else going on in our lives. But God, the amazing thing is we can still trust you no matter what. God, you take care of us, you provide for us, you remind us that you are still in control even when everything seems out of control. Father, in our world today that seems so out of control, the one constant that we know is that Jesus is still on the throne. We know that the Father still loves his children. We know that the gospel is true and that those who call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Father, we know that. And what an incredible thought to keep us lifted up. God, our, any troubles that we might have in life just pale in comparison to the wonder and amazement and beauty of Jesus Christ. Father, eternity is a long time. And when we really stop and think about it, this little tiny short life that we live is just a, a quick speck in time. Father, I pray that you would help us to know that in this speck of time, there are people that need to know you and that we would share the gospel. We would reach out. Father, we would share the gospel as quickly and as easily as we share a football score or a joke or a video that we found funny. Father, I think about how many people are watching um, dog and cat and baby videos on a daily basis. What if those same people were watching videos that told the gospel story? Father, Help us to make that the priority in our life, that we would be found faithful in your word. Watch over us, Father. Use us always for your glory. And we ask it in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, again, thank you for joining tonight or whenever it is that you may join. Thank you for being here. I pray that God touched you through his word tonight. And as we continue to study the book of Revelation, we will cover in two weeks we will cover that last letter to the seventh the seventh church um and that will be the uh the church at laodicea and so we will cover that last letter in two weeks and we'll continue on in the book of revelation so um please join us for that in the meantime i just simply want to say god bless and good night